And the first thing that I'd like to ask is just kind of give us some context about com- being a combat engineer in the Australian Army. How did you get into that? And what was that experience like? Oh, my God, Robert, that is the funniest question ever. And there's a whole long story there, which I'm going to condense. Um, I used to, I grew up in a very, very challenging set of circumstances. And basically, when I hit about 18, 19, I had enough of my life. I said, I'm going to go off and join the army. It was very much like that old Bill Murray film called Stripes, if you remember that one. I haven't seen it. Anyway, basically, none of their lives work out, so they go off and join the army. It kind of describes me. So I went off and joined the army. I was a combat engineer, which is basically really, I was a guy just putting up fences and digging holes. I was basically a laborer. Then what happened? I got a tap on the shoulder from these people in Canberra, and I got sucked into this world of drug enforcement and, um, you know, doing all, all, all cool undercover work for the federal government. So I had this co- whole massive transformation in my life, which was very, very awesome. And so tell me more about it, that experience. Like, did you like the work you were doing? Did you learn anything from it? Oh, it was absolutely awesome. I used to um, work with the federal government, uh, undercover quite often doing drug enforcement across Australia. And what happened was it was absolutely life-changing. And uh, I ended up getting almost killed doing that. Whoever thought buying drugs undercover was dangerous? No one ever told me that, Robert. <laughs> So it turns out buying drugs undercover is very dangerous. So anyway, I almost got killed. Um, I actually ended up basically getting a medical discharge. And uh, yes, what happened to me was um, I ended up going back into Civvy Street going, oh, what am I going to do with my life now? I ended up up going back to uni, finishing my degree, um, and ended up moving into marketing over the years. And that's how I ended up going into marketing. And I came in this direction, awesome, Robert. Okay, so let's let's dig a little, a little deeper into after the army. So you go to college. Was there a class you took, someone you talked to, a professor that got you interested in marketing? Tell me a little bit more about that transition. Yeah, what happened was I my original undergraduate was in industri- uh, industrial science, and I ended up working for a massive chemical company by the name of Henkel. Very big chemical company, great company by the way. And it was in that role I just fell in love with sales and marketing. And it was just for me. And then I ended up doing my postgraduate studies in marketing. It was just something I liked. I just naturally gravitated towards. Okay. And then let's talk about some of your first, you know, you said you naturally gravitated towards marketing. Do you think it was because you enjoyed the work, your personality suited it? Like, why did you gravitate towards it? Oh, yes to all the above. It was, oh, I, I enjoyed it. I am naturally suited to it. In fact, if you look at my disc profile, it's perfectly suited to uh, marketing. Um, yeah, I just naturally gravitated towards it and I was good at it too. And it's like all things, if you naturally gravitate towards something and you're good at it and you can make money out of it, oh, what more could you want? Absolutely. And so tell me about, you know, you got into it a little bit. What were some of your first jobs in marketing before we even got to LinkedIn? Oh, very funny. One of my first, um, my first, I'll, I'll talk about my wins. That's probably a better way of putting it. One of my first big wins was I was a young marketing manager for a bakery cafe franchise, which is a little bit similar to Panera Bread or St. Louis Bread Company in America, if you know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. Basically, basically the Australian version of Panera Bread, if I could say that. And did really well there, uh, absolutely kicked butt. And what ended up happening to me in that role was that um, I ended up coming up with a new brand that increased store on, st- store, on so- store on store sales by up to 30%, making the company millions of dollars. And that kicked off my marketing career. It was awesome. Okay. And then what was the next step after that job? The next step after that job was um, I ended up picking – I ended up – uh, the marketing director for Rest Point Casino in Hobart. So I was a, I was a casino guy. Not very. I tried to dress like Robert De Niro, but not too Robert De Niro ish. <laughs> but no, so I was a, a casino guy, and it was absolutely wonderful, and uh, absolutely kicked butt in those roles before the GFC hit, where I wound up a homeless veteran. What was the GFC? Oh, we call it, it was the global financial crisis. Um, got it, the, got it, the, got crunch, it. the crunch started by you guys in America, which fell on to us in Australia. And oh, yeah. um, it's easy for me to blame the global financial crisis on why I went up homeless, but I made a, I, I had a quite a few bad relationships. I used to waste all my money. I made a lot of dumb decisions, and that ended up um, I ended up uh, I was a homeless guy living in my car when I was thirty. 
And so what did that feel like to kind of move backwards and have to start over at 30? In a way, it felt good because it felt bad and good. It was bad in that I'm a failure and all that mental BS. But the, it, in a way, it was good because my life wasn't working out the way I wanted anyway. I wanted to start something new and start something afresh. And that was an opportunity to do that. And so what was the next step? You know, you're homeless, you're living in your car. How did you start working towards where you are now? Well, I decided, I spent a few, I ended up getting just a crappy job just to uh, pay the bills. I actually moved to Sydney at the time, um, Sydney in Australia. And I, that's when I was living in my car. And I decided that I want to start something new. And I always loved coaching. I loved marketing and coaching. And I thought, I could become a marketing coach. And that was really good. It was, and it was in my early 30s I started that. And uh, yeah, I started to really take off over the years. It's just been incredible. And so how does one start to become a marketing coach? Are we on LinkedIn at this point? Like what were some of those first steps? I got onto LinkedIn about then. And just to let you know, I've been on LinkedIn for about 10 years. However, yeah. but, there's a however but to all this. I only started getting good at it probably about mid last year. Mm-hmm. So I was on LinkedIn for a long time, but it took me a long – two things. A, the LinkedIn platform used to be a piece of rubbish, but yep. B, in which it, it was, right? But it took me a while to really understand how to get into LinkedIn. But once I did it, I've just jumped in there and absolutely nailed it and totally love it. Okay. And so talk to me about the first time you had the idea to start actually creating content for LinkedIn, was it a recommendation from someone where you seen stuff and you thought you'd join into the feed? Like, tell me about that first piece of content. It was probably more just seeing other people. So I used to put content on, fa- on when Facebook used to be good for business to business, right? Um, as you know, Facebook, just for the sake of the audience and yourself, Facebook used to be really, really good for business to business. Now it's just terrible, right? It's not yep. business to business doesn't really work on Facebook, which is exactly what they said, right? I used to put a, I started putting the same content on LinkedIn and started getting I started getting more views and performance out of LinkedIn than I did on Facebook. And I knew, aha, uh-huh, this is the future for me. And also as well, I've been a Microsoft acolyte since the age of twelve. I've always loved Microsoft. So for me, I've always been into that side of things and I've absolutely loved it. Okay, so, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so for me, Microsoft owning LinkedIn and LinkedIn being such a great platform. I just started putting videos on there and they just took off. And I'm like, wow. And at the start of this year, roughly, that's when I ramped everything up. Okay. And so video, were you comfortable on video? Did you have to convince yourself to get comfortable on video? Talk to me about creating that first video. Yeah, I originally got comfortable on video on LinkedIn, oh, correction, on Facebook. Not this year, but the year before. So the year before I went through a lot of mental stuff, getting myself good at video. So I was already pretty good at video before I jumped on LinkedIn. However, when I got onto LinkedIn, I ramped up the quantity. But in terms of the original question, it took me a lot of amping up and a lot of work to get good on video. Okay. And then, you know, for people who are listening, the reason I ask is because I think so many of our listeners want to start creating video content on LinkedIn. They see the opportunity, but it's really hard for them to get over that fear of creating the first video. So what were some of the things that helped you make that first video on Facebook? Yeah, three things. Uh, Number one is just getting over yourself, right? So just get over yourself and do it. Number two is put out just tips. Don't try and sell, just give out tips and value. And the third point is just get it done. You know, as, as entrepreneurs, you can't be held back by your own fears. You got to get over yourself. Okay. And so thank you for that. When you started, you know, creating more videos and ramping up on LinkedIn, you know, what was the impact on your coaching business? Like were people hitting you up left and right? Like how did you like walk me through some of the next couple steps? Okay. So I, to, to put in a timeline, I got into LinkedIn. Uh, let me say this properly, like properly into LinkedIn. Just say, let's say the start of last year for argument's sake, right? Just keep the discussion simple. So not this year, but the start of last year, I got properly into LinkedIn. As, okay. I, got in, as I got into it, I got, a, I got quite a few really good leads and a few high paying clients here and there. What happened, however, was the start of this year in about February is when I really ramped it up to a heavy content creation strategy. And after about two months, I now get at least 10 leads a day from LinkedIn. Wow. And out of those 10 leads, I had two yesterday, actually. Out of those 10 leads, one to two will be really good prospects. Okay. 
You know what I mean by leads and prospects? Absolutely. Yeah, cool. So, for example, yesterday I got two, I got 10, I always get at least 10 leads a day. But yesterday I had two really good prospects, meaning that these are people who actually rang me up yesterday to ask me about my services. Mm -hmm. And so, talk to me, what does the process look like when you identify a prospect, they message you on LinkedIn? What happens next? Yeah, so let's say quite often people will just add me on LinkedIn. And I'll accept and I'll start talking to them. And uh, it comes out pretty quickly. They'll just say, hey, Ed, um, I like what you're about. Hey, Ed, um, can, I, um, can we have a chat on the phone? I just want to talk about my business. Sure. Here's my, what's your number? Here's mine. Let's have a chat. And we just have a chat for a few minutes. And quite often this is what people do. People very rarely buy from me at the start. They usually right. buy from me two or three months later. Right. So it's not like, oh, I discovered Edward on LinkedIn today. And I'm going to give them some money. It's not like that. It's more like they'll watch you for a few months. They'll eventually contact you. They'll speak to you. Then they'll watch you for a few months and they'll convert into a customer. Okay. And so talk to me. Do you do, do any direct messaging yourself? Like someone's been commenting and liking a lot of your posts and you reach out just to get to know them? Not as much as I used to. So Robert, in the old days, when I was starting out, yes, I did. Now, because I'm quite popular, I can just react to what's happening around me. Right. Yeah. So what I do though is if I, if someone's like liking and commenting on all my stuff, um, generally speaking, I don't usually friend people. People friend me, right? And it's when people friend me, we start the conversation or if we're already friends, they just message me and reach out. If someone's messaging me a lot, like let's say there's someone I know they're commenting and liking on all my stuff, or let's say I talk about a workshop and they want to come, I'll ring them and get in contact. So yeah, I'll, I will reach out to people. But generally speaking, I don't reach out to as many people as I used to. Okay, that makes sense. And, you know, I've watched you get much more popular on LinkedIn as I've, you know, started getting on LinkedIn and creating content myself. So tell me, how do you come up with ideas every single day? Like, what's your process for the pre-coffee marketing videos? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the process is actually reflecting what's going on in my head. So I actually did a bit of research the other day on LinkedIn. I said, Ed, um, I said to everyone, why do you like my content? And the number one reason that came through was, Ed, your content's so real and honest. In fact, someone even said, you're the most real and honest coach I've ever seen. Which actually makes sense because when I do content, my content is a reflection of how I'm feeling in that moment. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to a whiteboard and writing down this list and saying, well, I'm going to talk about all these ideas to show everyone how awesome Edward's ear is. No, 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 no. I'm actually telling my story. So my content's really good because it reflects my honest feelings at that point in time, be it positive, negative, or somewhere else in between. Okay. And then talk to me about, you know, you're, you're being true. You're, you're, you're thinking about whatever it is that you're thinking about. How do you turn that into a piece of content that can be helpful for someone else? Because what I've seen a lot of people and myself fall into the trap of, it's like, okay, we have something to say, but it's like, why was it? No one really cares about that thing that we have to say. So how do you turn it into something that's valuable for others? Well, and, that, and that's the point. So the idea is what are you thinking about and what is the lesson you get from that? Mm-hmm. So I'm sharing the lessons from my own problems or not just me, but let's say my client has some problems or I have a problem. I'm sharing my own lessons from that. So for example, um, I got really sick a week ago just due to working too many hours, right? Really, really sick. Um, that's why I'm still a bit funny. I've actually just overworked myself a little bit. I've burnt out a little bit lately. And instead of hiding that from the world and making out I'm some I'm like the master chief from Halo or something like that right <laughs> you know I've been more like hey everyone just let you know I've burnt myself out a little bit and I'm chilling out a bit don't burn yourself out the way that I've done or that I do so it makes a lot of yeah because what where a lot of people go wrong and this most people make this mistake is they feel like they got to put on this front of how awesome they are yeah it actually doesn't work because people can see right through it. And this is, I did some research on why my content's successful. I, okay, I know why my content's successful, but I did some research on why is it successful. I'm trying to understand the mechanism. And it all came back to, Ed, you tell the truth. Yeah. You're the, it's like, um, and coaches, as you know, have a very poor reputation for just being liars, right? And, yes. and they're like, um, Ed, you actually tell the truth. It's like, I'm, and someone actually has, I've heard this before many times, people say, yeah, Ed, I often don't like what you tell me, but you're always... <laughs> 
percent accurate. Okay. And it makes a big point. Do you want to hear what you want to hear, or do you want to hear something accurate? Where I'm in the accurate club. And when you say accurate, that person is responding or reacting to the fact that they don't like how what you say exposes something about what they're doing or what, what do you think they're coming what angle are they coming at i'll give you an example the video i did this morning before our wonderful interview uh, robert is i did one on don't cop out right yeah now when i was um this morning one of my clients messaged me and they were trying to cop out of doing content on linkedin and i started berating them over messenger accusing them of being a cop out and telling them not to do that yeah and they then apologized. I said, don't cop out, right? And I did a video on saying, now, let's say you're copping out, right, in life right now. If you watch that video of mine, you'll get irritated and annoyed, probably, probably even irritated and annoyed at me. However, a day or two later, you'll turn around and go, I hate that Edwards here, but, oh, he's right. <laughs> that makes sense. And then, you know, when someone is copying out on LinkedIn, they watch your video and it makes them mad in the moment and they leave a hateful comment. What's your strategy for dealing with that? Is that something oh, that I've I delete seen? and block them. Delete and block. Yeah. Yeah. So with trolls, delete and block. And even in the early days, did you ever let that affect you? Like a lot of people can't really get started because they'll put out one video and someone will leave a really negative comment and then they just don't want to come back. Did you experience anything like that or has it been deleted and blocked? Of course I have. Of course I have. There's, I've been trolled more than there – there are next to, let's say, Donald Trump, not many people have been trolled more than I have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, I've been trolled a lot. So, um, And also, just to let you know, I'm an old troll myself. I'm an old guy from the 90s. Um, I'm an old gamer. No one could troll the way that we could. In fact, trolls these days don't know what they're doing. We trolled way better <laughs> in the 90s. This is like child's play. Oh, these damn kids, Robert. These kids today don't know how to troll. I'm serious. People today don't know how to troll. We trolled 10 times better in the 90s. What do people who troll today do wrong? Oh, they don't know how to troll correctly. Okay. So when you troll, and I'm an, again, I'm an old gaming troll from the 90s. No one can troll as great as I could, right? Saying just swearing or calling someone a mean poo-poo head is not trolling. It just makes you look silly. Proper trolling is asking questions or exposing someone's insecurity. Yep. That's proper trolling. But that uh, the, the art of proper trolling got lost. Now it's just like, oh, you're fat and stupid. That's not trolling. That's just, it's insulting people, but it's not proper trolling if you look at it from the proper trolling of the 90s. And in the proper trolling, is it just kind of the time and the amount of energy spent to actually think about something that someone might be insecure about or someone might, you know, uh, poking a hole in their argument. Is it just about the time and energy that's being put in? Oh, I just think just not very intelligent. So let's say you're trying to troll me, right? So let's say you watch my video this morning and you're trying to troll Edward's ear properly, right? Yeah. What you're trolling is saying, oh, Ed, you're just a dick. That's not very good trolling, right? That's, that's yeah. just dumb. That's like, a two, that's like four-year-old trolling. Proper 90s trolling would be saying, wow, Ed, you think you're really awesome, don't you? <laughs> what would be another example okay um i'm trolling myself here how else would i troll myself wow ed you're telling the truth right <laughs> do you see how mine's more manipulative and more gets yeah. into your head yeah that sinks in a little bit deeper yeah, yeah. That's okay funny. so the next place i want to go tell me a little bit about WeWork. I was looking through your profile and I see that you have, you know, a, a good relationship with WeWork. Tell me about how that got started. Yeah. So what it is, is that, um, so with WeWork, right? Um, so you know, WeWork owns Meetup, yeah? Uh, I did not know that. Okay. So a lot of people don't know that. So WeWork owns Meetup. So long, long story short, I used to, so I originally used Meetup to get really successful in my business. So just running regular Meetups, growing my business across Sydney. <laughs> Um, did really well out of it. Then I had a big break. Literally, the CEO of Meetup in New York found my Meetup events in Sydney. Literally, it was a big break. And he turned around and said, I like this guy. I want him to get in. Um, I just like this guy. And what happened was I actually got contacted by Meetup New York. They were looking for someone to help support the Sydney-based uh, community. 
Okay. And what happened was um, they said, look, Ed, we've got a role coming up. Um, if you want, it's all yours. And I took the role. And it was really, really good. And I kicked butt in it. And eventually they turned around and said, hey, Ed, you can support the whole of Australia if you want. Awesome. Then WeWork bought Meetup. So that's how I got involved into WeWork. Okay. And so what does your role with WeWork look like right now? Yeah. So with we, so with WeWork, I'm an advocate of WeWork. So I run a lot of events at WeWork. They sponsor me and support me. So I spend a lot of my time basically supporting and selling WeWork. It's really, really awesome. Right? Um, right. So I absolutely love it. With um, Meetup, I'm the city organizer. So what I do is I provide community support for Australia. Okay. And then tell me about, so are you still doing meetups for your business? Oh, yeah. I do them every fortnight to every week. Okay. And so talk to me about the structure of those meetups. Why do people come? What happens? And how does that translate into business for you? Yeah, well, my meetups go for about, um, they roughly go for about two hours. They go from 6 to 7.30. And it's a mixture of content, business networking, and I always run them in the evenings, usually Tuesdays and Wednesday nights. They're really good. Okay. And then are you there to, you're obviously you're speaking there. Are you inviting other speakers? Are you doing panels? Like what does the structure look like? No, I, I might have a guest speaker for 10 minutes, but it's mostly me giving advice and encouraging the audience on different topics and running networking activities. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And so I've not, I've not found panels to be very effective, nor have they worked very well at all. People, most people find them boring as heck. Okay. Okay. And so for your model, you think just doing the keynote speaking and do you leave a lot of time for networking at the end? We do networking during, so every 10, 15 minutes, we have a three, four minute networking break. Oh, nice. Yeah, because the way it works is, and me included, in fact, I'll ask you this question. Do you like sitting there for an hour having someone lecture you? Nope. <laughs> yep, exactly. Neither do I. So every 10, 15 minutes, we have a networking break. Very good. And people okay. love it. That's why people love it. Because again, I don't like sitting there. I don't mind sitting down for 10, 15 minutes and standing up. Yeah. But I don't want to sit there for an hour being lectured to by some moron. I agree. And I think it Not makes a lot of sense that people are going is to network with others. And the more time they can do that, the better. Yeah. And then they like you more because if I just sit there and lecture people for an hour and a bit, people are just going to hate me and they're going to rightfully turn around and say, oh, that Ed's all about himself. And you know what? They're right. <laughs> yeah. They're right. But, but if it's like 10, 15 minutes networking, Ed, Tim, no one can say that with any degree of logic. They'll be, oh, wow, that event was really good. I met like 10 different people and Ed gave me all these tips. And it was like energetic. It always kept changing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very hard to argue that I'm some kind of, you know, narcissistic loser because it's sort of like, well, Ed let me network every 10, 15 minutes. Like you, you can't then to accuse me of just dominating the place. Absolutely. So yeah, well, you can, but it, it just no one will believe you. <laughs> <laughs> so what I want to talk about next is a few LinkedIn features that have rolled out um, over the past, I believe, six months. So I want to talk about LinkedIn Live, and I want to also talk about uh, sending uh, video messages in LinkedIn. So have you taught? Have you been on LinkedIn Live? Are you a beta tester? No. Um, so LinkedIn Live um, is not available yet in Australia, to my knowledge. Mm, okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, usually. We get stuff in Australia quite late in the game. Oh, interesting. Well, that's interesting because so many people in like the like. Tell me about this. Let's let's go here. Talk about the LinkedIn community in Australia. Yeah, that's full of great people. Yeah, I'm just it's interested. Good. Full of great people. Yeah, I'm just interested because you know I see so many people. Um, on LinkedIn that are really popping from Australia, you know, Tima El Haj, um, to be, to be one, like, um, talk to me a little bit more about like the community in Australia, like do you create events, um, in, like, are there LinkedIn local events in Australia that you attend and go to? Yeah. So with LinkedIn local, um, one of my friends actually, um, Brendan Rogers actually runs one of Australia's link, uh, biggest LinkedIn locals does an incredible job. Um, so you have a, you have quite a few LinkedIn locals across Australia. Um, some are really big, some aren't so big. Um, Brendan does a really, really good job of his. Uh, 
you also meetup is also huge in Australia. Sydney is the fourth biggest city in the world for meetup. So meetup's quite big in Australia. And interestingly, meetup and LinkedIn local actually compete with each other. Oh, really? I had no idea. Yeah, they do. So for example, link because meetup is so big in Sydney, partly due to me, um, LinkedIn local within the C Sydney CBD is actually not done as well as it has in other cities, for example. Got it. Okay. You know, so you have a lot of different factors at play, albeit you know, I have a lot of respect for LinkedIn local. The other factor at play too is that when you actually think about it, not many Australians are actually on LinkedIn. If you look at the actual population of Australia, not many of us are actually on LinkedIn, relatively speaking, which I think is awesome because it's more opportunity for us. And when you um, say people are on LinkedIn, they're not creating content for LinkedIn or they just don't have profiles? Well, they have profiles, but what I mean is they're not using LinkedIn seriously. Yeah. That LinkedIn's just some weird app on their phone that they don't really care too much about. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah, they're not like looking at it like, because I, the way I look at LinkedIn, um, and also just to let you know, I'm also working directly with LinkedIn in Sydney as well. So I'm also mm -hmm. working directly with people. So a lot of the, what I've learned about LinkedIn, I've, I've had it all checked by LinkedIn personnel. The other interesting thing is as well, is that with LinkedIn, LinkedIn is an amazing platform. And a lot of people don't understand that it's owned by Microsoft. And a lot of people don't understand Microsoft treats LinkedIn with the same importance it does Outlook and Excel. Yes. So I treat LinkedIn with equal importance to Outlook or Excel. It's right up there in the Microsoft suite. And a lot of people don't understand that. And I treat it that, that importantly. And that's one of the reasons, because again, I used to hate LinkedIn when it was just LinkedIn. The moment Microsoft, about probably about 18 months into Microsoft buying it, I just, I think LinkedIn's the best platform ever. Absolutely. And I can, uh, I can second that. LinkedIn has really helped me, you know, grow my own audience. Whereas, you know, on other places like Instagram and Facebook, like the organic reach, just it's much, much harder to grow anywhere other than LinkedIn. Yeah. And that's where you got to look at the different companies. Now I've been a Microsoft fan my whole life, right? So I'm 41. I've been into Microsoft since my early teens, right? Since probably about 12 years old, right? I'm doing yeah. like King's Quest, Space Quest, Leisure Suit Larry. I'm talking the old Sierra games, golden era, right? Yeah. So I'm one of those guys, right? I'm one of those guys from the 90s, right? And uh, yeah, I had a Commodore 64 that I went to PC, like IBM. It was called IBM in those days, but my, and then Microsoft kicked it. Anyway, what you got to, and this is where a lot of people, I, I can say this because I've been following Microsoft pretty, the majority of my life, right? So I know Microsoft very well. You got to look at the different cultures of the company. Now, Facebook and Instagram is owned by Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. And that has a certain type of culture that's very, very interesting. So Facebook used to be a really good platform. Then what happened was um, Zuckerberg with his culture then decided to clamp down on the organic reach to push paid advertising. Yep. They want to make money. Yeah, yeah they want to make more money. And, that's a, and then surprise, surprise, um, they're doing the same thing to Instagram right now, which you'd expect, right? Of course you would. Of course. Now that's the site. Now, a lot of people, people who've worked with in Facebook have turned around and said that wasn't a good move for the company because in their mind, that was to drive advertising revenue. What it ended up doing was driving people off the platform. Yep. Me included, right? It drove a lot of people off the platform. And, and that's, very, that's very Facebook culture. It's very, very Mark Zuckerberg Facebook culture in terms of, you know, hang on, treat it, um, you know, hang on, you know, you're getting something for nothing here, mate. We need to sort that out. It's a bit like that. Yeah. That's not Microsoft culture. Microsoft culture is so not like that. Microsoft culture is very much open, inclusive. Um, you know, if you make a million bucks on our platform, power to you. We love you because you're our customers. And so how do you see the fact – so LinkedIn's at a, at a point right now where the organic reach is through the roof. Based on what you just said about Mark Zuckerberg and how he saw that opportunity – started doing paid ads. Do you see Microsoft doing something similar or what route could you see them going potentially? Well, just to let you know, organic reach has decreased a lot on LinkedIn. Yeah. Because there's more content, right? Yeah. And I actually expect organic reach to keep decreasing on LinkedIn because of um, because there's just a lot, lot more content going on there. Yes. Now, I think organic reach will kick in, will continue to decline um, because more and more people will be putting up content. 
And Microsoft and LinkedIn will turn around and make their algorithms smarter to show people the right content. Yes. Okay. So what I'm saying is organic reach, organic reach is going to decline, not because Microsoft or LinkedIn is doing something sinister, but because that's just the way the platform is going to develop. <coughs> that makes sense. So that's going to happen. It's going to happen. However, there's a big however to it. About three months ago, um, apparently my LinkedIn made a few tweaks to its algorithm and basically the, the, it basically turned around and said, we're decreasing organic reach. That's apparently what was told. Now, what was interesting is a bunch of people were running around complaining, oh, my God, my organic reach has decreased. Mine increased during that period. Really? Yeah, so what happened was about three, four months ago, a lot of people were like, oh, my God, the sky's falling. Um, oh, yeah. the organic reach is decreasing. Oh, Bill Gates this, Bill Gates that. Um, mine was going up in that period, and mine still continues to go up. And here's the big point. What really happened, they were trying to blame the LinkedIn algorithm for their decline. That wasn't it. What it is is that other people are taking away their viewers because other people are producing better content than they are. Yeah. <coughs> Pardon me. So where I want to go next is a few more things before we, we get off Zencaster here. You know, when I uh, asked you to come on the podcast, you sent me a bunch of video messages and you're the first person to ever send me some video messages. So tell me about your strategy with video messages and why you think they're so effective. Well, it's not that I think that they're effective. They are effective um, yeah. because I'll give an example. If you're speaking to someone over LinkedIn, would you be more interested in someone that sends you a full video message aimed at you or just sends you a one, uh, a few words in text? Definitely the first. Yeah, there's your answer. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, it just, because, you know, I send a lot of voice messages myself, but um, going that extra step and sending like a short little 10 second video message to someone, like it really, it really stands out. Well, yeah, it's proof that you care. That's what it is. It's proof that you care. It's sort of like, was that the end of the day, right? Like when I connect with people on LinkedIn, it's like, I'm not connecting just for the hell of it. It's like, are we going to do something? Yeah. It's like, oh, no, it, like I've, I've, had an, I've had an interesting one. Actually, this happens every few days. I'll have someone, no, maybe, maybe once or twice a week. I'll have someone add me on LinkedIn. Then I'll send them a video message and a voice message. And then they remove me as a connection. Really? <laughs> and it's like, man, you must be really messed up in the head. Yeah. It's like, what's wrong with you? Like, I, I don't know you when you added me, which is technically against the LinkedIn rules, right? But that's okay. I accepted you. I send you a video message reaching out and then you remove me. It's like, man, I hate to see your personal life. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? what's going on in your head, pal? Like, you need some help. Yeah, too close to comfort for them. Oh, it's just a freak. It's just like, man, what's wrong with you? It's like, you know, I bet you don't have any friends and your relationships don't last more than 10 minutes. Yeah. And I think the same can be said for a lot of the, you know, fake trolls um, that we see on, you know, people like your content and other people who are popping on LinkedIn. Well, to be honest, I'm actually quite depressed about trolls. Trolls actually make me really sad, but not for the reasons that you think. I miss the good old trolls of the 90s. Yes. <laughs> like the trolls are just, I don't know what happened. They're all just so dumb these days. Oh, Ed, you suck. Oh, you're a moron. <laughs> Do you ever respond to say something like, uh, did you try harder? No, I just delete and block them. Right. Yeah. But I miss the good old trolling of the 90s. Like that's when it was proper trolls. Absolutely. The yeah. well, hi, like let's say someone wants to call me fat, right? You don't say, hey, Ed, you're fat. You say, hey, Ed, how are those three donuts you're eating a day going? <laughs> does that make sense? It does make sense. I think you, uh, you certainly have a knack for this, your experience. Yeah. So proper trolling is asking embarrassing manipulative questions. And, and, and exposing insecurities. It's like, you know, people troll Trump, right? Now, love or hate Trump, right? People don't know how to troll him correctly on Twitter, right? Oh, it's like, oh, Trump, Trump, Trump's a... You know, I won't say the word, but Trump's a certain faction from World War II that was based in Germany. Yeah. Right? I won't yeah. say the N word, right? That's not trolling. That's just insulting someone. Proper trolling is being, hey, 
do you find any, you know, you, you more ask embarrassing questions. Yep. You know, you don't say, for example, you don't say orange man bad. You say, hey, Trump, how much work a day does it take to become so orange? <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, that's all you meant to do it. <laughs> You, you, you are definitely very, very good at that. Um, what I want to talk about before we get off, I want to give you a chance to talk about excellence above coaching. You know, someone who has listened to this entire podcast, they like you, they like your vibe. How can they get involved with you? Oh, yeah. So what it is, so I'm a marketing mentor and master coach. And uh, what I encourage is um, if anyone's interested, please add me on LinkedIn. When you add me, though, just don't just hit the ad key. Actually say, hey, Ed, I listened to your podcast with awesome Robert Boyle. Uh, love to connect. hundred percent. And then can you just tell them a little bit more about some of the services you offer, why they might want to go with you, what they'll get out of the experience? Oh, exactly. So marketing mentor and marketer coach. So basically I help transform people into becoming master persuaders. Hmm. So I teach people sales and marketing, heaps of different strategies. I've got online courses, which can be done from anywhere across the world, run webinars, got workshops in Australia and more. So heaps of cool stuff. Awesome. And the last question that I want to ask you is over the next six months, um, what kind of new things are you planning on doing on LinkedIn? Are you going to try out new forms of content? Like, tell me about your LinkedIn content strategy over the next six months and how you see it changing. Yeah, well, I think for me with my LinkedIn, I've already made a lot of changes lately, actually. Um, I'm actually changing my LinkedIn every day. I've been, I've been spending more time promoting other people, um, helping support job seekers, and I've also been spending a lot more time sharing more targeted content. So, yeah, that's the way things are going to go for me. Um, my views, interestingly, my total views have gone up for the – because I target mostly the Australian market, albeit I've got a global audience. Um, my views are going up in Australia and I absolutely love it. Well, that's incredible. It's been really, really fun to watch you grow, especially as, like you said, you've been posting all these pictures with people just really trying to promote them and help them get jobs and help them get more visibility. It's been great to see. I suppose that's where I've changed because my LinkedIn used to be very much me just giving tips all day, but now I've got more variety of content. So I suppose that's the answer. So for example, in a day, I'll give tips, I'll invite people to my workshops, I'll promote people I know and job seekers, and then I'll say some funny, weird stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, for example, when I got in bed last night with my wonderful wife, I said, I should post something on LinkedIn now, like some text. And she goes, Ed, you're not an influencer. You're a weird influencer. <laughs> and I'm like, yes. And I posted it on LinkedIn. My wife just called me a weird influencer. And how did that got post? Viewed, it got viewed over 3,000 times. It was hilarious. and just got walls to walls of comments. <laughs> That's so, really I've been, so, I've been posting more off-the-wall funny stuff. Like, for example, another one, I'm actually planning on posting this tonight um, because at times, my, I've got an S10, which is a waterproof phone, right? And I, at times, I've been standing in the shower looking at my LinkedIn, right? <laughs> so, what I'm going to post tonight, I've decided, is something like this on LinkedIn. Um, everyone uses LinkedIn in the shower, right? It's normal, right? I'm not yeah. asking for any reason. <laughs> like, just we get off. I like just doing weird off the wall stuff like that. And and it makes you seem more, again, like you said, more real, more human, gives more variety, makes people more attracted to you. And it's funny. It's just like, you're just sitting there going, whatever. And someone's talking about, oh, everyone uses LinkedIn in the shower, right? It's normal, right? I'm not asking for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you say it in a weirdly defensive sort of manner. Like, it's just funny. That's funny. I will definitely, when that goes up, I will, I will try to find it and I will comment on it. Yeah, because everyone, um, everyone does it, right, Robert? Everyone uses LinkedIn in the shower. Everyone of, does of, it. Of course, of course, of course, Edward, of course. Anyway, Edward, I want to right? thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you for doing this on, on a cold. You know, I had no idea that, you know, you had taken some time off to, you know, work, focus on your health. So I want to thank you for doing this. I want to thank you for making the time and uh, yeah, have a great rest of your day. You too. And I was going to say thank you, Robert, and to the wonderful audience. I love your work and bless your hearts.